The bar is packed tonight, but don't worry. There's no waiting around for me. Look, a bar stool vacated with perfect timing for me to slip in. And right away, a bartender dressed immaculately, despite the crowds, with attention only for me. Yes, I'm very well, thank you. I'll have a martini. Shaken, not stirred. Hello, welcome to Patented, a podcast about the history of inventions by History Hit. I'm Dallas Campbell. Thank you very much for your company. Guess what? It's been 70 years this month since the first James Bond book, Casino Royale by Ian Fleming, was published. So we're finding out a little bit about the inventions that have made Bond Bond, as it were. This time we're slipping on our tuxedos to explore the origins of cocktails. And one cocktail in particular, because what would Bond be without a martini by his side? I'm chatting with David Wondrich about who invented cocktails in the first place. When did they become cocktails? When did they become cool? And how to make the perfect martini. Indeed, who invented the martini in the first place? Plus, I discover who is to blame for my least favourite word in life. Actually, not my least favourite, but certainly one of the most annoying words. Mixologist, for goodness sake. Anyway, it's time to wet those taste buds. David, welcome to Happy Hour at Patented. Lovely to have you. Lovely to be here. Thank you so much. You know where we should be? My favorite place, where well, it used to be my favorite place, is the American Bar in the Savoy in London. Oh, it's a lovely bar. Have you been there? I've been there many times, but not in a few years. Me neither, because I don't drink anymore. That's a bad place to be if you don't drink. <laughs> I know. But back in the days when I was drinking, if I was feeling flush or particularly happy or excited, I would walk down to the American bar in the Savoy and sort of blag my way in because sometimes they're a bit funny. You had to book or something. You got to kind of know somebody or something like that. But it's a fine bar, though, and a bar with a long and rich tradition. Yeah. Now, for me, I don't drink anymore, probably because I drank too much, too many cocktails. But for me, there is only one cocktail, and it's the dry martini. Dry martini, you know, that's always going to be the king. It is, isn't it? It is. There are many other drinks that are just as good. And I mean, a perfectly made daiquiri you cannot touch. Really? Okay. But the dry martini is still its world, you know? There's something about it as well. I think culturally, I remember I used to watch MASH when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I remember Hawkeye in MASH, there was a constant running gag about him trying to make the driest martini ever. And there was that thing he said, you pour six jiggers of gin... And you drink it while staring at a picture of Lorenzo Schwartz, the inventor of vermouth. Yeah, <laughs> I was always very taken with that. And it turns out it's all early 1950s BS. Is it? When people were trying to outrank each other on how dry their martini should be. But there was a long time when the martini was the sole survivor of this whole world of cocktails. And it was the last one that you could expect to get. It was the one that was for grownups when everything else was sex is on the beach and all that kind of stuff. That's exactly it. For me, all those funky sex on the beach, blah, 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 was for the kids. The dry martini was for the grown-ups. So just for the uninitiated, just explain, because there's a bit of confusion about martini. Can we just break the martini down, how you see the martini, and I'll tell you if you're correct. Well, <laughs> <laughs> everybody lives in their own martini world, you know, yes. where they are the ultimate arbiter. But dry martini is a drink with gin and vermouth in various proportions. Whatever you really like is the best martini. You can add orange bitters. That was always a part of the early dry martinis and is delicious. I believe there should be some vermouth in there. I agree. Because, I mean, the joke of the dry martini was like you would get the bottle of vermouth down and show it yeah. to the glass of gin. Basically, neat gin. I'm with you. I like a bit of, I say I like, I liked in the past tense, a little bit of vermouth or a little atomizer spray on the top, maybe. I learned how to drink martinis in old man bars in New York in the late 70s, early 80s when I was very young. And those were always the no vermouth whatsoever kind. 
because that's how they made them. It's just hardcore. It's hardcore. But, you know, these days I'll do it sometimes equal parts vermouth and gin. And that's just, I guess you could say, more digestible, which I'm being very euphemistic there. For me, the fun of the dry martini was you'd order it and you'd basically get very, very cold, like ice cold gin. And you'd drink it. And it's that fantastic feeling of your toes slightly going a bit numb. And then that sort of numbness creeping up until it hits your brain in the American bar at the Savoy, and then going, life is okay. When you get a good martini like that, I always used to say when I was drinking those very dry martinis that the shortest distance between two points is a dry martini. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. (laughs) You know, and that was the best. But you can still appreciate them. It's a very surprisingly malleable drink. There are many different ways of making it. You can make them soft and elegant. You can make them taste like jet fuel. You can make them... Whatever your mood, whatever your place in life, there's a martini for you. Fun with alcohol. Actually, my granny used to drink. She's no longer with us, obviously. But my grandmother, gin and it, she used to drink, which was, and gin and French. And she would distinguish between gin and it and gin and French. Well, the gin and it is the original martini of the 1880s. Yeah. It stands for Italian. Yeah, it's Italian vermouth and gin, and it's a little bit sweet. I was trained to regard that as being like putting toxic waste in my gin. Yeah. But (laughs) when I actually made one, I was like, oh, you know, this is delicious too. Yeah. It's just different, but it is delicious. And gin in French is the French vermouth, which is Noily Pratt. Yeah, and that was the original dry martini. It was dry not because there was hardly any vermouth in it, It was dry because it used a not sweet vermouth. I feel like we've dived into this conversation at the deep end. We've cut out the entire beginning and middle and gone straight to the end to talk about martinis. Well, it's like drinking a martini. (laughs) Exactly. God, I'm going to have to start drinking again, I think. I've just just suddenly got that muscle memory of drinking dry martinis. I don't know. I would say the times around us would warrant that. But, you know, this conversation, you're probably fine. I tell you what, while we're on the subject of martinis, let's just get something out of the way first. Let's get the whole sort of James Bond martini folklore out of the way. I mean, when we think of a vodka martini, we tend to think of James Bond shaken, not stirred, which in itself is controversial. First of all, vodka is controversial and the shaken, not stirred is controversial. So maybe you could just take us through those little parameters. You know, originally it was always a gin drink. And there are still sticklers you'll find who say that if it's made with vodka, it's not a martini, it's a kangaroo, which was an old name for a vodka martini. But, you know, that ship has sailed long ago. It's still a martini if it's made with vodka. It just might be a little less exciting to some hardcore martini types. So you can make it with vodka. James Bond made a big play out of having it made with vodka to show that he was a secret agent who'd been behind the Iron Curtain and knew about things like vodka. Oh, is that where that comes from? That Russian Cold War thing? Yeah, he would put the grains of pepper in the vodka. There are all these things that Ian Fleming picked up from talking to people who'd been behind the Iron Curtain, I guess, because Ian Fleming had been in the Secret Service too. And why the shake and not stir? Because I was always taught you must always stir, not shake. It has a better texture, the drink when you stir it. It doesn't really change it otherwise. If you shake it, you shake a lot of tiny little bubbles into it. But I think for James Bond, it was because lazy bartenders would stir it twice, you know, and it wouldn't be cold enough. If you stir it like a skilled bartender who's doing the job right, it's even colder when you stir it than it is when you shake it. That's it. I mean, for me, it is about temperature. It's about that just bone chillingly cold. Yeah, absolutely. Like the American historian and curmudgeonly drink critic Bernard DeVoto said, you know, a martini should be an ounce and a half of gin, half an ounce of vermouth and 500 pounds of ice. (laughs) He's not entirely wrong. No, exactly. You want it very cold. Just while we're on Bond as well, I'm just curious, Ian Fleming and Bond and that whole culture, where did the kind of booziness come from? Why were they big cocktail drinkers as opposed to beer drinkers? Well, it came out of the culture that Ian Fleming was in. It came out of World War II, the Great Depression, men tended to drink. It was the social thing to do. And Ian Fleming had James Bond drink in a very conventional way for Ian Fleming's class. There's only two things that James Bond like really drinks willingly. Well, three. Champagne, always, of course. Of course. Never turn down a glass of champagne. That was my grandmother's motto, actually. Never turn down a glass of champagne. Yeah, exactly. That was always good sound sense. Then there's the dry martini, of course. 
And the other one is bourbon. Not Scotch whiskey, bourbon. Why bourbon rather than Scotch? Because I always think of Scotch being the slightly classier and bourbon a bit more hard drinking. Yeah, but there was that kind of James Bond as being like transatlantic. You know, he's a new man. He's not like the club tie type. He's a little rough. But also there's another thing that during World War II, bourbon was much harder to get than Scotch whiskey because America shut down its distilleries and Scotland didn't. Because of prohibition or is it after? No, it was because it was part of getting this massive war production up and going. They needed a lot of neutral spirit. And so they made all the whiskey distillers make neutral spirits. Oh, that's interesting. Let's just start from the beginning, actually. I want to ask you about, first of all, the term cocktail. Now, when I'm in America, if I have a gin and tonic, that's kind of classed as a cocktail. But over here, it wouldn't be. When we say cocktail in the UK, people think of sex on the beach and nonsense and umbrellas and slices of pineapple. This is another thing that people argue about endlessly. There's the narrow definition of a cocktail, and then there's the broad term that everybody uses, and it's kind of stupid to fight against, which is any mixed drink really is a cocktail. If it's cocktail hour, gin and tonic counts as a cocktail. Where does the term cocktail come from? Do we know? <laughs> this is uh, somewhat indelicate. That's okay. My li- my listeners, listen to me being grand. The listeners are very indelicate. They won't mind. Okay, good. It goes back to England. Cocktail originally, the drink and the name come together in America. And the drink that got that name was spirits. Usually it was Dutch style gin because it was a New York drink or the New York area, and that had been Dutch. So it was gin or Geneva with sugar and bitters and water, not even ice yet. And that formulation actually goes back to London. The idea of bitters and sweet spirits goes back to Richard Stoughton, an apothecary on what was called St. Margaret's Hill, I believe, which is right south of Borough Market in London and across from the George Inn, as a matter of fact which was standing when his apothecary store was there. Wait, so is he sort of cocktail 1.0? No, he's the man who invented the bitters. Oh, okay. Sorry, yes. This is very important because with no bitters, no cocktail. Can we just establish bitters? I think of Angostura bitters. Yeah, that's a variety. Stoughton's bitters are similar. Okay. It was the idea of taking all these bitter and aromatic roots, barks, et cetera, steeping them in alcohol and making something that you can put a little dash of into a drink and it'll do your stomach good was his idea. But he also advertised it as having a pleasant, if bitterish taste. And it was basically an instant version of a traditional drink, Pearl, which is bitter ale. And so he said, why waste time by steeping herbs in your ale for a week when you can just put a little spoonful of my stuff in and it's done. And he also advertised it as a great hangover cure when mixed with brandy, which was already sweetened at the time. Everything was sweetened, all the spirits. So if you've got sweet spirits plus bitters, you have a cocktail. But the word cocktail, though. The word cocktail comes 100 years later in the late 18th century, and it was a nasty thing you did to make horses perk up. (laughs) Expand on this. (laughs) If you were less ethical than you or I might be, and you were trying to sell a tired old horse... You know, first you'd put shoe polish on it to hide the gray and make it look glossy and you'd brush it well. And then you'd take a knob of ginger or a hot pepper and shove it up its butt. And the horse would, as you would imagine, as any of us would, would start fidgeting and displaying a lot of spirit. So the buyer comes and goes, oh, you've got a frisky one here. I'll give you four pounds for it when it's a pound and a half horse, (laughs) you know? (laughs) So it made it seem younger and livelier. So around 1790, this term starts to kind of migrate to drinking and it's the ginger that you would put into your ale or spirits in England to spice it up and for your morning drink. Now in America, it went a step further and became the drink itself the mixture, not the spice. And, you know, the idea was you would take it in the morning, a cocktail in America, to cock your tail up. Okay, which is what I do when I'm about to record a podcast. I shove a ghost pepper up my ass, or my (laughs) ass, as we like to say here. And then you fidget a lot. You're very lively. But it perks me up a little bit. Yeah, it does. I don't speak from experience, but I've heard tell. (laughs) So the idea of the cocktail, the invention of bitters, 
the sweetening of alcohol, this term. Yeah, it's these things come together. And, you know, in America, it starts off as just a morning drink. And it remains a morning drink, actually, for a long time, even into another 100 years, into the 1880s. They're still serving as many cocktails at 8 a.m. Really? As they are at 8 p.m. See, well, the Bloody Mary you can get away with, I think, at drinking at 8 a.m. That's the sort of breakfast cocktail of choice. Like if you're on an early flight in the morning, you can just about get away with a Bloody Mary. But Anything else seems a little bit gauche. Well, in the interests of science, I've tried the old gin cocktail as a morning drink, and it's startlingly effective. <laughs> <laughs> Your day for an hour plus, you're just smooth into the day. You slide into the day. However, you know, you got to keep it up. And you read accounts of what people were drinking, the kind of people who had an eight o'clock eye opener there. A little sharpener. Sharpener, we'd call it. We've got all kinds of names for it. Cocktail was just another one of those, a corpse reviver, you know. When I think of cocktails, I'm thinking tuxedos. I'm thinking maybe the 1950s. and Well, actually earlier, I suppose there's a roaring 20s. When did it suddenly become this sort of fashionable thing and all these different explosion and types of cocktails come along? It really started in the 1880s when the Manhattan and the regular martini were invented. And that was the decade that first in America, it saw cocktails move from the sporting life, which, you know, a little disreputable, into some sort of mainstream acceptance. And then it pops over to the UK. In 1893, when the Savoy opened, it did not have an American bar. They put it in in 1903. The American bar. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was that decade that they caught on in England, largely because of the efforts of this guy, Chiro in Monte Carlo, who had a very popular bar with the visiting English gentry. With these specifically cocktail bars as opposed to anything else? Yes, they specifically made a lot of cocktails. Let me just get that right. So it started off in America around about that time. Yeah, it started the big explosion, the acceptance of the cocktail as a part of respectable life, let's say. So when it moves from being somewhat underground to okay for regular folks. What was the first cocktail bar as such in America? Is there such a thing if you want to go back to the ground source of cocktails? Well, yeah, there are early bars like the City Hotel in New York in the 1820s, 1810s. Cato Alexander's Tavern, also outside of New York. Now it's like in the middle of Manhattan, but at the time it was two miles, three miles from New York City, which was just at the bottom of the island. And these were very popular places, known for their cocktails, known for their mint juleps also, and things like that. If I was in my hot tub time machine and I whizzed back to the 1880s and I'm in New York. What was the first cocktail bar that you mentioned in New York? Well, oh, there was Cato Alexander's bar is in the 1810s, 1820s. That was the first American bar I know of famous for its mixed drinks. And if we went in there, if we walked in, what would we expect? Well, you'd see Cato himself. He had been born into slavery. He was a black man, very distinguished and very well liked in New York. And you'd see him welcoming you. He would be behind the bar. He'd be supervising the cooking of the food there. It was a bar and grill. There'd be a bunch of gents sitting around chewing tobacco and smoking, sometimes with their feet up on the table. Some of them would be drinking punch from bowls. Others would be drinking huge mint juleps with a forest of mint sticking out of the top of each. People would be playing bowls outside or throwing quoits, you know, big metal rings that weigh about four pounds each that you're throwing to get them on a pin. There's all kinds of games and the bar room, you know, low ceiling, wooden floor, maybe some sand on it to keep liquids from spreading all over the place. And it would be very lively scene, a little bit rowdy, there was violence in there because American bar rooms were always violent places, even the fanciest ones. But it would be an overwhelming sensory experience, I have to say. We'd walk in and everything would go quiet suddenly and everyone would turn around and look at us. No. <laughs> no, this is New York City. <laughs> you know, Actually, you'd walk in and there, who the hell are you? We don't care. You know, they just wouldn't pay any attention to you. Okay, so we've got a lovely picture of where it all begins in America in the 19th century. And a lot of those early cocktails are still very familiar. Who was coming up with these ideas? Things, things like Whiskey Sour and the Manhattan. Uh, very, did... A lot of them were really old. And we don't know who came up with them because they were old and spread around by word of mouth. Bartenders didn't have press agents, nobody there 
to whip out their phone and take a picture of you with your new cocktail that you invented. It all, and it wasn't reported in the newspapers or anything. Hey, there's a new cocktail that everybody's drinking. That, that comes fairly late. So uh, we don't know the inventors of most of these things. We don't know who invented the martini. We don't know who invented the Manhattan. I thought the martini had a very specific invention. Wasn't it like the 1880s? There was the first recorded naming of, of the martini. You could say when it's first recorded, but you don't know what it was doing before it made it in print. When was it first recorded? The martini in 1883, the Manhattan in 1882. And they were both... The same drink, essentially. One used gin and the other used whiskey, but they both used the sweet Italian vermouth. Which is called Martini, I suppose. The brand is called Martini. That was the big brand. That's a pretty big clue as to where the name probably comes from, but nobody can prove it. So we're at the early 20th century. Cocktails are suddenly becoming popular. When do they suddenly get into that kind of super chic evening? I think of the Rat Pack and sort of Dean Martin and Sammy Davis. Yeah, that really starts during Prohibition, but the mixology is not so good. But there are some very expensive speakeasies in places like New York and Los Angeles and Chicago. This is when it was banned. This is when America banned alcohol for some insane reason. Yeah, the usual fighting that we have over here. But it starts to get quite chic to, uh, you know, have a cocktail. Once you've got Prohibition over in 1933, then you get very fancy cocktail lounges open throughout the country. And that's very, it's very popular, very chic. At the same time in England, it's been so since the end of the First World War. It's been very chic, you know, bars like the Savoy and all kinds of bars in London, very popular. The Grosvenor with their white lady, everybody had a drink, you know, each one had their signature. See, I'm of an age where, you know, I grew up in the 80s, so I remember watching Cocktail with Tom Cruise, twirling cocktail shakers around and bouncing them about. How did that happen? That was a little bit of American madness from the 1970s. <laughs> sort of performance art of cocktail making. As drinks got worse, bartenders <laughs> had to justify their existence in other ways. Put it that way. Okay. It really starts late 70s, early 80s. The best bartender is the one who can juggle the most bottles. You know, it doesn't really affect the drinks because the drinks were all in the order of sex on the beach or vodka and cranberry juice. There really wasn't much to them. These weren't people who were drinking Last Word and White Ladies and all these elegant no. old cocktails. They were drinking some pretty basic stuff. So, you know, throw the bottles around and people will like it. Is there anyone we need to know about who was, did anyone sort of invent that as such? Like who's the kind of, oh, the barman of such and such? There are a few. It comes out of the TGI Fridays bar in New York and its expansion in the early 70s. And that was kind of the last institution to really train its bartenders in cocktails. And because there was training, it kind of went in a weird 1970s direction. <laughs> and it ended up doing a lot of flashy stuff. I remember going to TGI Friday in New York once and seeing that for the first time being absolutely yeah, like, this is magnificent. It's wild when you see it. And then, you know, when you get the cocktail as often as not, it's like, wait, I'm drinking this. this is, <laughs> yeah. you know? But then suddenly, as we move on from the 1980s, like suddenly you weren't a bartender anymore. You were a mixologist. And that's when I kind of raised my eyebrows a little bit. I'm like, really? Are we just rebranding being a bartender? Well, mixologist as a name goes back to the 1850s. Does it? Okay. Yeah, there's, there's no other word in English for somebody who's very good at mixing drinks. You know, bartender covers a lot of territory. There are many different kinds of bartenders. There's something like sommelier, for example, as yeah. a wine. That kind of sounds sort of legitimate and classy, maybe because it's French. But like mixologist sounds a little bit like... Well, mixologist is pure American and it comes from a humor magazine. Oh, really? And, okay. and it was a joke, but it got adopted because... You start to see people advertising to hire mixologists like 10 years later. You know, the word had gotten into industry use because there was nothing else. Which magazine was it? It was in the Knickerbocker magazine, I believe. Somebody talks about this guy. There was a lot of dialect humor popular in America, like people writing in American rather than English, the, the way it was actually spoke, the way it were spoke, as they say. And somebody's talking about, it refers to the bartender as the mixologist of tipiculars, <laughs> like tipples, you know, tipiculars, or the mixologist of tipicular fixins. And that was pure American right there. I'm really happy because I've always been a bit sniffy about the word mixologist because I thought it's, it's like some kind of corporate 
jargon had made it up, but it's uh, that's good. Ben. And it always has a little bit of taking the piss incorporated in it. So, you know, <laughs> if you say with all seriousness, I'm a mixologist, you can laugh at them. Okay. Where are we now with all this? Because like everything, it's become a kind of art form. And I look online and the kind of frozen ice cubes are the perfect globes and glasses and smoke and craziness. You know, things got crazy. From around 2000 to 2010, there was a huge sense of rediscovery. It's like bartenders used to be this very precise art of mixing drinks and people actually knew something that they were doing and they made drinks that their customers really enjoyed. Can we do that again? And it turned out, yes, it took a lot of work, but yes, we could. That was phase one. Phase two is like, all right, we've learned to do that. Now, where can we take it? And that's where things starts to go a little bit off the rails. I've had, I've been served cocktails that come in a glass with a paper bag tied with twine around it, mushrooming up like the top of a Montgolfier balloon. And you pull the twine and pull off the paper bag and there's a puff of smoke and then you drink your cocktail. I kind of resist that. I think that's a bit far for me. I tend to go for a very simple line in drinks these days. One of the things I've noticed, actually, I guess in the last 10 or 15 years, is that certainly when I was in my 20s, like gin wasn't particularly popular. Like in the UK, we had like Gordon's Gin or Beef Eater, something like that. But then hipsters happened. And then suddenly like, oh yeah, gin became like a real like hipster. And they put the word craft in front of it. And suddenly everything that had the word craft in front, craft gin and stuff. Well, you know, what's funny is if you look at the actual sales figures, at least in the US, they're selling less gin than they were in like 2000 or 1990. However, they're selling a lot more expensive gin. The cheap gin drinkers are all dead. (laughs) <laughs> and I, I got out in time. <laughs> yeah, it's all young people drinking expensive gin now. And there are millions of different varieties. There used to be four, five. Yeah. Well, exactly. Like when I was around, when I was around, when I was drinking, it was like gin was gin. Here's the thing. I cannot tell the difference. And people will go, oh, yeah, actually, the botanicals are really nice. I'm like, it's gin. It gets you drunk. Well, there's some that taste very weird now. But if you put tonic in it, you're not going to taste the Ta- gin tonic. Tonic anyway. will will pretty much negate a lot of the exactly. weirdness. But yeah. if you make dry martinis are pitiless, though. You know, if you change the gin in your martini, you're going to taste it. Okay, well, here's a test for you. What is the correct gin for a martini, in your humble opinion? I can't say what the correct one is. I can say what I use. What do you use? I use. Tanqueray, the American strength, 47%, like the old English used to be before they watered it down shamelessly. I use that for the martinis where I use a lot of vermouth. I use Plymouth, which is a lower strength for martini where I use very little vermouth. And sometimes I use Heyman's, which is made by the family that used to do beef eaters. They have one that's a very sneaky 57% alcohol. So I use that for my ones where I use a real lot of vermouth because I like to cheat. (laughs) And so I get all the vermouth in there, but there's still plenty of alcohol in it. Okay. So I'm going to say dry martini, probably your favorite if you were going to pick a favorite martini. Yeah. Dry martini is, that's the one that you keep coming back to, put it that way. That's the one that I keep coming back to anyway. And what for you is the abomination of the cocktail world? Well, the apple martini I found severely trying. That was a drink of the 90s, and I found those to be pretty revolting. And what is the, for our listeners who want to go and have a little sharpener, what's the great underrated cocktail that you think, oh, actually, why isn't this more? Well, you know, a sidecar is still criminally underrated, I think, and that's a delicious drink. Cognac, Cointreau, lemon juice, shaken up, delightful. Damn, why did I give up drinking? I'm having (laughs) (laughs) David. Hey, you had me on the show. I mean, it's your own fault. (laughs) David, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. The pleasure has been mine, Dallas. Thank you so much. It's been great. What a lovely little tour of the cocktail. Thank you so much. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've had your appetite whetted. I hope you will immediately rush off to the American bar at the Savoy or your local pub and ask them to mix your martini in celebration of James Bond. And if you're enjoying the show, don't forget to listen to all of our other episodes. Don't forget to tell your friends, family and bartenders to listen as well. If you've got a suggestion for a topic, a story you'd like us to cover, you can, as ever, email us at patented at historyhit.com 
or just shout at me.